Ya, ya, ya. Gue pegang. Ngomong oh, di tata-tata. Bisa di situ. Udah sini aja ya. Sini aja. Selamat siang. Yang terus saya hormati Profesor James Fox. Ibu Rina. Eh, sorry. Nini. Ibu Munandar kepada Bapak Jesse Greman, Ibu Rina Hermawati, terus siapa lagi tadi lupa. Saya atas nama Ibu Kuncara Ningrat hanya mau ingin mengucapkan selamat datang pada semua hadirin dan para pembicara. Dan terima kasih telah meluangkan waktunya untuk hadir siang ini di sini. Selamat menikmati Kuncara Ningrat Memorial Lecture, Kuncara Ningrat Legacy and Contemporary Anthropology in Indonesia. Thank you. Terima kasih Mbak Tiput. Uh, di sini ada Ibu Stin, uh, istri dari Pak Kun. Mungkin yang muda-muda belum pernah melihat at atau uh, apa ya belum pernah ketemu Ibu Stin Ibu Stin boleh berdiri ah. <laughs> ya jadi ini uh, Ibu Stin istri dari Pak Kun makasih Ibu Stin udah datang oke selanjutnya saya minta kesediaan Pak Mulyawan Karim sebagai Ketua Umum Forum Kajian Antropologi Indonesia untuk menyampaikan kata sambutannya. Terima kasih banyak Dante untuk waktunya. Selamat siang, saya ucapkan untuk semua. Saya kira ini sebagian besar dari kita yang tadi pagi juga sudah hadir, jadi saya tidak perlu mengulang lagi semua apa yang sudah saya sampaikan, tapi Selamat datang lagi di ruangan ini, di ruangan yang indah ini. Terus terang waktu saya kuliah dulu di ruangan belum ada nih auditorium yang seindah ini. Jadi generasi muda antropologi dan generasi eh, mahasiswa fisip sekarang ini jauh lebih beruntung lah dari kita-kita dulu ya. Jadi ini patut disyukuri dan kita sebagai senior-senior juga merasa senang gitu loh bahwa adik-adik difasilitasi untuk belajar di tempat yang jauh lebih baik daripada kita-kita ini dulu. Ya, tapi dulu ada taman sastra di mana Mbak Tiput biasanya kuliah di situ dia. Ya. Oke, terima kasih banyak sekali lagi. Saya ucapkan, saya hanya mau menjelaskan sedikit bahwa Kuncorneng Memorial Lecture ini adalah sebuah sebuah event tahunan sebetulnya, ada annual agenda dari Forum Kajian Antropologi Indonesia, di mana saya bersama teman-teman, eh, sebagian besar adalah murid-murid Pak Kun dulu yang masih sempat, yang kita selenggarakan itu setiap tahun bergantian. Nah, tapi tahun ini, it's a very special Kunjung Memory Lecture, karena tepat besok Pak Kun 100 tahun, jadi kita betul-betul menyambut Hari kelahiran beliau yang sudah meninggal pada tahun 1999. Jadi ini uh, historical event lah menurut saya ya untuk uh, kami di forum kajian dan juga untuk teman-teman uh, di Departemen Antropologi di sini. Jadi ini uh, sesuai yang istimewa. Dan lebih istimewa lagi bahwa yang akan memberikan lecture kali ini adalah juga orang yang sangat istimewa. Pak James Fox. Pak James Fox nanti akan... Pak James Fox ini saya jelaskan aja sedikit kenapa kita memilih beliau. Beliau ini adalah salah satu antropologi asing ya yang sempat mengenal dengan sangat baik Pak Kun, saya kira juga dengan Ibu Stin ya. Dan uh, menurut beliau Pak Kun itu adalah sebuah orang ilmuwan dan sebuah pribadi yang sangat istimewa. Beliau juga menyampaikan dengan senang hati menyambut tawaran untuk menjadi pembicara tunggal sekarang ini karena beliau merasa berhutang budi begitu besar terhadap Pak Kun tadi waktu kita ngobrol-ngobrol begitu Pak James bilang jadi untuk itu kita juga terima kasih ya dan kita doakan bahwa apa namanya terima kasihnya Pak James sampai juga ke Pak Kun di atas sana 
Nah, lalu yang kemudian yang saya mau katakan juga adalah bahwa KML tahun ini itu adalah yang ke-20. Jadi kita ini sejak forum kajian atau libur berdiri pada tahun 1900, eh 2004 kalau tidak salah kita dirikan ini uh, yayasan ya. Dan tahun itu pula kita juga menyelenggarakan. Nah, kuncuran rekan yang pertama kalau tidak salah diselenggarakan juga di Bentara Budaya. Di tempat di mana kita juga merayakan atau memperingati 100 tahun uh, Pak Puncoroningrat. Jadi ini dua lembaga yang memang selalu uh, sejak lama bekerja sama untuk uh, apa namanya memuliakan Pak Kun sebagai guru dan ya bukan hanya guru di kelas ya tapi juga guru ya guru guru apa ya, guru kehidupan mungkin ya. Jadi dia mengajarkan kita banyak hal di luar ilmu antropologi ya bagaimana kita harus bersikap sebagai orang yang bermartabat dan orang yang uh, orang yang apa yang santun dan orang yang uh, sederhana ya uh, saya kira itu ciri-ciri dari pakun itulah ya kesederhanaan dan kerendahan hati dan lain sebagainya jadi ini adalah tepat yang ke-20 dan seperti biasa apa namanya Biasanya kita mengangkat tema-tema itu yang terkait dengan masalah-masalah yang sedang aktual di Indonesia ya. Masalah demokrasi, masalah diskriminasi, masalah uh, lingkungan juga gitu. Tapi tahun ini sangat istimewa karena kita akan bicara mengenai legacy, warisan dari Pak Kun. Apa sih yang Pak Kun wariskan kepada kita semua dan bagaimana warisan itu membentuk juga Uh, ilmu antropologi saat ini ya ikut membentuk uh, uh, ilmu antropologi Indonesia saat ini. Saya kira itu saja yang saya mau sampaikan. Uh, tidak perlu panjang-panjang lagi. Terima kasih banyak. Dan satu hal saya mau katakan bahwa uh, ada pepatah orang bilang saya pernah dengar entah siapa yang ngomong bahwa orang itu kebesarannya itu tidak diukur pada saat dia hidup, tapi pada saat dia sudah meninggal dunia gitu loh. Pak Kun. Sudah lebih dari 20 tahun meninggal dunia, tapi dia masih bisa menyatukan kita semua. Uh, untuk itu uh, kita amat hormati dan kita uh, syukuri ya bahwa kita masih bisa berkumpul karena Pak Kud gitu ada di uh, bersama kita saat ini. Terima kasih banyak. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Mas Muke. Ini memang luar biasa hari ini karena pembicaranya Pak. Jim. Jadi seharusnya kita baru mulai acara dua seprapat, eh kok bisa-bisanya jam dua kita udah mulai. Karena tadi rapat Pak Jim bilang, Pak Jim 20 menit aja. Tidak bisa, saya paling singkat 40 menit waktunya. Oh oke okay, Pak Jim, yang penting tanya jawab harus lebih lama dan bisa lebih banyak kesempatan buat teman-teman bertanya atau menjawab. Jadi kita majukan waktunya, untuk itu kita akan segera memulai pembicaraan ini. Akan dimoderatori oleh Mbak Nini. Mbak Nini itu pada tahun 2005 lulus S2 Antropologi UI. Lalu pada 2012 pensiun dari Kementerian Pendidikan. Pendidikan nih Mbak, Kementerian Pendidikan dan Kebudayaan Ditjen Dikti. Lalu 2012 sampai sekarang mengajar di Universitas Bina Nusantara, jurusannya komunikasi komunikasi pemasaran. Tuh antropologi kok kerjanya pemasaran ya? Gitu ya. Pertanyaannya lagi ya. Lalu 2012 membantu Proyek Bank Dunia untuk peningkatan kualitas pendidikan tinggi kesehatan 2012 sampai 2014. 2014 sampai sekarang menjadi Direktur Umum dan Keuangan pada Lembaga Akreditasi Mandiri Pendidikan Tinggi Kesehatan. Waktu dan tempat kami persilahkan Mbak Ni. Terima kasih Mbak Dante. Saya beresin ini dulu ya Bapak dan Ibu, mohon maaf.
Baik, selamat siang Bapak dan Ibu. Uh, semoga dalam dua jam ini uh, presentasi yang disampaikan oleh Prof. James Fox membangkitkan kita pada kenangan masa lalu maupun pada tantangan ke depan. Karena ini adalah jam-jam jam-jam kritis, Prof. Jam-jam di mana sudah kenyang dan mata ya apalagi dingin ya. Jadi mudah-mudahan uh, Prof. James Fox bisa apa namanya informasi atau kabar terbaru tentang antropologi bisa uh, membuat kita matanya terbuka. Baik, uh, mungkin saya persilahkan dulu kepada Prof. James Fox untuk maju ke depan. Baik, dengan seizin Prof. James Fox, jadi saya mendapat kiriman dari Mas Muke sebanyak ini ya tentang CV beliau, tapi dengan seizin beliau saya hanya akan menyampaikan secara singkat saja uh, kurikulum vitae Prof. James Fox. Prof. James Fox sekarang sebagai Profesor Emeritus pada Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies di Australian National University. Beliau mendapatkan doktoral filosofisnya pada tahun 1968 di Oxford University untuk Social Anthropology. Kemudian uh, saat ini, academic position beliau adalah adjunct professor untuk University of Indonesia. Uh, banyak sekali beliau sudah mendapatkan awards untuk bidang akademik ya. Uh, namun yang terbaru di tahun 2010 beliau mendapatkan award untuk Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Contribution to the University. Uh, kalau uh, hal lain yang saya kira perlu di saya sampaikan bahwa beliau saat ini juga bergabung pada International Secretary for Australian Academic of the Social Science. Dan uh, Presiden untuk apa, tahun 2021, Presiden for Associates of Asian Social Science Research and uh, Councils. Uh, saya ingin bacakan sedikit saja dari current research interest beliau. Jadi current research interest beliau adalah History and Anthropology of Indonesia, Agricultural Development and Resource Management, Particularly Rice Policy, Uh, kemudian anthropological theory, linguistic uh, anthropology, particularly the study of semantic parallelism, comparative Australian studies, the study of Islam, general policy research relating to environmental management in Indonesia and East Timor. Uh, banyak sekali buku dan artikel yang sudah beliau publish. Uh, saya tidak akan bacakan satu persatu karena beliau juga sudah berpesan singkat saja begitu ya. Baik, baik seperti sudah disampaikan oleh Mbak Dante dan Mas Muke, Prof. James Fox akan menyampaikan uh, dalam topik Kuncara Ningrat Legacy and Contemporary Anthropology in Indonesia. Saya persilakan, Prof. Prof. mau di sana atau di? Formal lecture. Yeah. Okay, lah. Professor Dr. Haji Kanjeng Pangeran Hario Kuncharaningrat merupakan seorang yang istimewa. Kita yang berkumpul bersama hari ini 
dan mereka yang mungkin pada satu saat di masa depan membaca narasi ini. Right? Akan ingatnya dalam berbagai caranya. Mereka yang dekat akan ingatnya secara, secara intim sebagai suami, ayah, atau sebagai kakek. Dan yang lain di antara kita akan mengingatnya sebagai seorang guru, pembimbing, dan tokoh intelektual yang memiliki kebijaksan, kebijakan dan kemampuan yang luar biasa. Sebutan yang dikenal yang dikenal oleh banyak di antara kita adalah Pakun. Pakun ada seorang akademis, seorang artis, seorang pendiri ilmu antropologi di Indonesia. My task in this lecture will be to focus on the academic achievements and the institutional legacy of Pakun. Now, I've, as a typical academic, I've prepared a lecture that is much too long. And saya corat mungkin separuh. Sisanya akan banyak. So please be prepared. And if it's too long, it's just because Pakun achieved so much in his lifetime. I cannot, however, commence this task and, and, and detach myself from the current considerations of my, without my explaining my personal involvement with Pakun and the wise guidance that he gave me in the course of my own career. It is with this involvement that I want to begin this lecture. Saya dan istri saya tiba di Jakarta di bandaran di bandara Nudara Kemayoran dalam curah hujan deras pada tanggal 30 Januari 65. Kami diantar ke Hotel Indonesia di mana sebagian besar orang asing menginap. Tetapi dalam waktu singkat, kami berhasil menyewa sebuah pavilion di Jalan Bondowoso, Menteng. Tagal itu dari dulu saya dapat dijuluki anak Menteng. Sesudah, sesudah saya datang ke Indonesia dengan, de, sudah saya datang ke Indonesia dengan rencana Malaku, melakukan penelitian di Pulau Rote. Pulau Rote, Pulau Kecil, dekat uh, Pulau Timur. Tetapi tidak memiliki visa penelitian jangka panjang dan tidak memiliki sponsor akademis yang dapat mendukung rencana penelitian saya. Jadi, setelah air ba banjir surut di Menteng, saya bersama istri naik beca dalam perjalanan panjang dari Menteng ke Rawamangu untuk kunjungi Pakun di rumah. Ketika, ketika itu kami sama sekali tidak kenal, dikenal Pakun pada waktu tiba-tiba muncul di rumahnya. Akan tetapi Pakun dan istrinya Stin menyambut kami dengan hangat. Pakun ambil waktu untuk membaca proposal penelitian saya yang sangat berbelit dengan teori dan 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 anjarannya Profesor Rodney Needham, pembimbing saya di Oxford. Saya berencana men, 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 meneliti prescriptive alliance dan circulating connubium dengan segala asasumsinya teoretisnya. Dengan halus, namun jelas dan tegas, Pak Kun memberikan nasihat yang bijaksana. Nasihat pertama yang banyak nasihat yang saya terima 
dari beliau dalam tahun-tahun sesudahnya. Beliau mengatakan akan mensponsor penelitian saya dengan senang hati. Akan tetapi, saya perlu membuat fokus penelitian yang lebih masuk akal, lebih praktis, dan lebih relevan untuk kehidupan sehari-hari di Indonesia. Akhirnya, saya menulis proposal sepanjang tiga linya. Pendek sekali. Dalam bahasa Indonesia yang memang sederhana. Proposal itu mengarah penelitian saya ke, dan saya kutip, di mata pencarian tradisional dan kegiatan-kegiatan baru dalam perekonomian modern. Nah itu. Saya masih menyimpan proposal penelitian yang hanya satu halaman itu, karena tulisan itu menunjuk bahwa Pak Kun dan bukan pembimbing saya di Oxford yang mengarahkan saya sehingga menghasilkan buku buku pertama saya, Harvest of the Palm. Sudah tentu dan tepat pula Pak Kun menulis pengantar untuk terjemahan buku itu dalam bahasa Indonesia, Panan Lontar. Allow me to begin my commentary on Pak Kun's achievements and legacy with a brief account of his early education and training as an anthropologist. Pakun was born on the 15th of June, 1923 in Jogja. In Javanese reckoning, he was born on Jumat Paing. He was the only son of RM uh, <coughs> Emawan uh, Broto Kusumo and, and R.A. Pratitis Tirto Nonoyo. His father was a member of the Paku Alam court who served as a court official. As a boy, Pa Kun was raised within the intimacy of the court with a deep sense of the Javanese langu language and a growing knowledge of his position in the wider, wider surroundings. Pa Kun recounted accompanying his father on inspection tours to the west of Yokja and being entertained by vill village Jat Jatilan and Barong dancers. So he still could see that in his time. At home, however, Pakun was expected to speak Dutch with his parents. His mother, who took responsibility for his initial schooling, was intent on his obtaining a Dutch education. And for some years, she tried to limit his involvement in the traditions of the court. He began school at Europeische Ur Lager School in, in, Jok in Jokja and went on to Middelbaar Uitgebreide uh, Lager Onderwijs and Algemene Middelbaar School. When he was still in high school, Pakun's parents moved to Jakarta where his father took up a position, a government position. Pakun stayed on in Jokja and fled, freed from his mother's control. He reimmersed himself in Javanese traditions, especially Javanese dance and music. From one of his high school teachers, he learned to draw and started to paint as well. By the time he had finished high school, Bakun was proficient enough to become an instructor in Javanese dance. When he graduated, the war had broken out. The Japanese had, 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 had entered. Pakun moved to Jakarta to join his parents and began, as he has recounted, to learn Indonesian as his third language. He started as an assistant. He worked as an assistant at the National Museum of Jakarta. He collected books that the Japanese had thrown out. He, and he cataloged them and eventually managed to ship them all to Jogja, where they established the foundations of the Gajamada Library. He also taught uh, Jogja court dances at the Jakarta branch of Taman Siswa. In 1945, when the Dutch returned to Indonesia, Bakun moved back to Jogja 
to join the Revolutionary Republic of Indonesia. A amazingly important decision of his that was in fact cast his whole life in the direction that he was to follow. He was a member of the first generation to enroll at Gajah Mada University. Before beginning at the academic year, however, Pakun re renewed his involvement with both students and artists teaching, teaching history at Taman Siswa and court dance at Griyo Tejo Kusumo. He briefly became a Tantara Palaja and was posted to the 29th Brigade uh, in Kadiri to whom he taught history and English. By that time, he was already had a knowledge of English. Fortunately, he was recalled to Jogja for the beginning of the academic year at Gajamada before the 29th Brigade shifted allegiance, joined Musso and the communists in Madiun and was completely wiped out. When he enrolled at the University of Gajamada in 1946, Pakun studied Indonesian literature. After his graduation, he moved to Jakarta where he taught cultural history at Budi Utomo and continued his study at Universitas Indonesia for the doctorandus degree in literature and language and literature. He graduated in 52 and stayed on in the Faculty of Arts as the assistant of, of Professor G. J. Held, who was then professor of anthropology, was uh, in Leiden circles, a very famous graduate of, of Leiden University. In 1954, Kuncharan Ingrat was offered a Fulbright scholarship to study anthropology at Yale University. Yale's anthropology department at that time was at its height, certainly one of the leading, if not the leading university of anthropology in the United States. The department was administered and dominated by the presence of Professor uh, George Peter Murdoch, who had published his major work, Social Structure in 1949 and had begun compiling what was then became the Human Relations Area Files, an initiative of great comparative significance for American anthropology. And in fact, it's still going today. I had an email uh, notice about their latest uh, uh, activities. I had an email yesterday from the Human Relations Area File. So that is still going through Yale University. Not surprisingly, as a student at Yale and on Murdoch's prompting, Pakun was put to work adding information on Indonesia to the human relations area files. At the time when kinship was the dominant mode of anthropological inquiry, Pakun wrote a thesis at Yale University entitled, A Preliminary Description of the Javanese Kinship System. In his preface, Pakun appropriately thanks G.P. Murdoch for his valuable suggestions, but extends his special thanks to his supervisor, uh, pa Ed Bruner, for guiding his work throughout, and Mrs. Bruner for correcting his English. A preliminary description of the Javanese kinship is, in my opinion, a minor classic. The first attempt in English to describe the differentiation and variation in Javanese social life and governance written precisely at the time when Indonesia was disengaging itself from its colonial past. The work is historically oriented. Pa Kun draws on Dutch writings on Java that go back to the 19th century. But given, Pa's, given pa Kun's intimate knowledge of Javanese life, his study is subtle, nuanced, and clearly articulated. It treats kinship not in some simplified manner, but simply as a vehicle for a wider discussion. Importantly, and I recommend everyone, if you have a chance to go back and look at this minor classic, importantly as well, it epitomizes the style of analysis and presentation that Pa Kun would put forward throughout his long career. 
So this was, and we have to realize that his MA thesis was his first major contribution to anthropology in general. Not a small thing. Now, this is a Charitra has various versions, okay? Sablum brankat ka America sarikat, sachara resmi, pakun, bertunangan, dengan kustianti sarwono, wanita yang kemudian menjadi pendampingnya selama hayatnya. Mereka bertunangan pada tanggal, saya harap benar, 29 April tahun 54. Sebelum Pak Kun meninggalkan Jakarta, mereka nikah dalam satu upacara resmi perkawinan dengan adat istiadat Jawa di Jakarta pada tanggal 13 Agustus 55. Sementara Pak Kun sudah berada di New Haven. Pada perkawinan itu, Pak Kun diwakili oleh sebuah kris yang diperolehnya dari ayat. Now, there is another version of this and a better version of this in the last chapter of the book we launched yesterday. So instead of believing all of that, what I said, get the truth from, from Stin Langsu. Stin kemudian bergabung dengan Pak Kun di Amerika Serikat dan keduanya menjadi pasangan yang tidak terpisah dalam karya hidup. Saat kedatangan Stin di Amerika Serikat, Pak Kun merancang masa berbulan selama satu minggu di New York. Yang berdasarkan ingatan Stin terdiri dari serangkaian konser dan opera termasuk Parsival Karyawan. Stin mengetik naskah-naskah tesis Pak Kun yang dipublikasikan dalam seri budaya program studi Asia Tenggara di Universitas Yale. Now, after two years of graduate work and a successful MA thesis, Pak Kun had expected that he would go on for a PhD at Yale. However, he was recalled to Indonesia. He was recalled to Indonesia to take part in the academic transition with the taking part in the University of Indonesia. On his return, oh, on his return from Yale, Pak Kun began immediately on his PhD under the supervision of Professor, uh, Professor Dr. Elizabeth Allard, young Pernasai Ketemu di Leiden, pada satu waktunya. He, he completed his thesis, uh, Beberapa Metoda Antropoli Dalam Penalitian Masyarakat dan Kebudayaan Indonesia in 1958, and immediately took up a position as lecturer in anthropology at the University of Indonesia. At the same time, he, made an, he was made an extraordinary lecturer at Gajamada University. His life's task of establishing and indeed of creating the discipline of anthropology in Indonesia had begun. In 1962, at an early stage in, his, in, in this creation process, Pak Kun took a year's sabbatical at the University of Pittsburgh. At this time, his mentor and supporter, George Peter Murdoch, had retired from Yale and moved to the Department of Anthropology at the University of Pittsburgh. Pak Kun's academic immersion in American anthropology continued. On his return from Pittsburgh, Pak Kun was made professor of anthropology at the University of Indonesia. Pak Kun faced an enormous task in creating anthropology as a relevant and engaging discipline at the national level. One of his tasks, indeed, the first of his undertakings, was to prepare introductory textbooks on anthropology in the Indonesian language that he and others could use for teaching. Pakun produced a succession of major textbooks for anthropology and social science research uh, <clears throat> and research, social science research in general. And just, just to name that succession, Pangantar Anthropology, Anam, Anam Sambilan, 
Toko Toko Anthropology, and I'm, uh, I'm Pat Beberapa Pokok, Anthropology Social, and I'm Tuju, Atlas Ethnography, Sedunia, and I'm Sambilan, Metoda Penalitian Masharaka, Tuju Tiga, Dan Bunga Rampai, Kabudayan, Mentalite, and Pembangunan, Tuju Ampai. Now, most of these publications were frequently, very frequently reprinted. Often the new reprint, and often for the new reprint, Pakun would revise, expand, and update his work. Thus, and I just take one example, uh, Pangantar Anthropology was only 115 pages when he was first published in 1959. But the time of its fifth reprint in 1972, the volume had grown to 223 pages. The volume was then revised republished under the title Pangantar Ilmu Anthropology. It continued to grow so that by the time of its eighth, eighth reprinting, the new edition in 1990, it had come to 391 pages. In 1996, Pakun did a further revision, changed the, title, the name of the text to its original Pangantar Anthropology. And this new edition was published in two volumes, uh, with a total of 430 pages. So I, I can't imagine how he could keep up with all of these things that he was doing at once. I think, again, the person to ask is, as is Ibu, Ibu Kunjana Nigrat, how could he do all these things? It just, to me, it seems almost, un well, it is unbelievable. The second, an even more challenging task that Bak Kun set himself was to establish the discipline of anthropology in universities throughout Indonesia. The University of Indonesia became the base for his training program with the most promising students at other universities invited to Jakarta continue their anthropological study. Bak Kun would regularly travel to other universities to lecture but he would also send out his graduates to teach the basic anthropology curriculum that they learned at the University of Indonesia. The seven universities included in this network were Gajah Mada University in Jogja, Bajajaran in Bandung, Udayana in Denpasar, North Sumatra in Medan, Hasanuddin in Ujung Pandang, Assam Ratulangi in, in Manado, and Chenderwasi in Jayapura. So all of those universities he was visiting and teaching at and gathering students and all of that, in addition to all of the books he was writing and all of the other things he was doing and teaching, continually see teaching. Development of ethnographic understanding of Indonesia, Indonesia's diverse cultures with this emphasis on the contemporary situation was at the core of Pak Wun's contribution. Anthropologists in each university where they taught were encouraged to develop their distinct character and regional ethnographic specialization. Pakun went to considerable lengths to see that his students were sent overseas for further study, and he was determined that they obtain specific training in different subdisciplines of anthropology in order to enrich the field of anthropology as a whole. He was, in, he was also concerned that anthropology students study not just in America or, or Holland or in, 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 in England, uh, but also in Japan and Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines. So they were able to return to Indonesia to teach courses at, at the cultures of these countries. Pakun set out to foster the development of a broadly based discipline, anthropology, within a conceptual field of the social science. And not anthropology per but anthropology in the social sciences. He, more than any of his contemporaries, referred to Dutch historical research and scholarship. In fact, he had a masterful command of Dutch literature on Indonesia. But as he remarked in several of his writings, after 1955, he marked that year, 1955, this research was largely overshadowed by American research on Indonesia. He referred to this American approach 
in the social science as the Mashab America. Pakun was an active participant in and a contributor to this Mashab through his publications in English and as a propagator of this Mashab in Indonesia. He worked brilliantly, in my mind, brilliantly to develop his publications as required. For example, when village studies were the fashion in American anthropology, in 1964, he edited Masyarakat Desa uh, di Indonesia Masa Ini, which was a collection of specific village studies by Indonesians, Dutch, and American researchers. This publication became Villages in Indonesia, which Pakun published through Cornell University in 1967, the English version of this volume with his only minor changes from the Indonesian version. So he had the opportunity to prepare stuff in Indonesia, then move it into English and make a contribution both you know, to the, the, the larger Masat America. Although Pakun acknowledged the contributions of British social anthropology, particularly the quality of extended field work, his own formulations of an, in anthropology uh, were focused on culture, on kabudaya. Prompted by a succession, a successful production of Masyaraka Desa, pa, Pakun went on in 1971 to edit, and this is another important book, Manusia dan Kebudayaan di Indonesia, which can be in some ways considered a landmark in the anthropology of Indonesia. This volume consists of substantial ethnographic accounts of various cultures of Indonesia from Aceh to Irian, put together by Pakun and a dozen of his students and colleagues who were by then teaching anthropology at other universities in the country. The volume provides ample evidence that in just over a decade, one decade after embarking on his teaching career, Pakun indeed had succeeded in directing and training an entire generation of committed students and colleagues with a sophisticated ethnographic understanding. Manusia dan Kabudayan di Indonesia is a who's who of the first generation of anthropologists and should be recognized as such a landmark as such. The book is an attempt to provide ethnographic coverage across Indonesia. As contributors, virtually all of this new generation of anthropologists were at the time still doctorandi. And several undertook to provide accounts on regions outside their eventual area of ethnographic expertise. The dafter para pangaran that lists these contributors, their background, and the universities to which they were attached in 1971, hints at the foundations that Pakun had begun to build. Pakun contributed both the introduction and the conclusion to this volume, as well as ethnographic accounts of the cultures of North Coast Irian and of Florence. With James Dananjaya, who had just returned from Berkeley, where he had obtained his MA degree, Pakun had also contributed the ethnographic account of the barrier islands, Nias and Mantawe. James Dananjaya, who was then a lecturer at UWI, wrote on central Kalimantan. Parsudi Suparm, Suparlan, who was a junior lecturer at UWI, wrote on the culture of Timor. And while pa Puspa, sorry, Puspa, Varsati, who held a special appointment in anthropology at UWI, wrote on the culture of the Chinese of Indonesia. Su Subyakto, who held a joint junior lectureship in anthropology and sociology at UWI, wrote on the culture of Ambon. Nico Kalangi held a special also a position at UWI and at Sam Ratulangi, wrote on Minahasa. Beyond the University of Indonesia, Tunku Samsudin at Shakwala uh, contributed coverages of Aceh, Panjang Bangun and Ikip Medan coverage of Batak, Arsoyo Har at, at, at Pajajaran wrote on Sunda, Kodrian uh, in Kajamada and Java. 
E. Gusti and Gura Bagus, a very good friend of mine, at Udayana, Rotan Bali, Matulada at Hasanuddin and Bugis Makassar, Yusuf, Umar Yusuf, and, uh, based in the University of Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur, wrote on the Minangkabau. It's interesting to note from a theoretical point, it's interesting to note that in this early volume, some of these anthropologists wrote on their own culture, signs of the autoethnography that has been a continuing tradition in, 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 in Indonesia, while others, many others, wrote, uh, including Pakun, wrote on other cultural traditions. Pakun continue, continuing development of, an, of his understanding of anthropology is evident in his presentation of the history of the discipline. These are, these are actually very important. Toko Toko Anthropology, published initially in 1969, grew into Sejara Theory Anthropology, History of Anthropology Theory, which was published in stages. Volume one in 1980, is a revision and expansion of Toko Toko anthropology and was intended in part, as part of an ambitious series of volumes in, on the theory of anthropology and sociology. And only Pakun's book appeared. All of the other books that were promised never did a munch. Volume one uh, cites a variety of proto anthropological studies, Herodotus and Abdul Rahman bin. Kaldun, then, then Marsden, Raffles, Riedel, you know, a variety of theorists, French theorists, Turgot, Rousseau, Comte, before considering the early founders of anthropology, such as Spencer, Morgan, Tyler, Fraser, continues on through Durkheim and the Anne Sociologique in France, uh, Greiber and Schmidt in, in Austria, Rivers and Elliot in England, Boas, Krober, Loewe, Dunline Line in America, and uh, Malinowski, Radcliffe, Brown, and Hokart. In this history that focuses mainly on the prominent personalities and theories that he espoused, but was, and this is always the thing that so entrances me about this book, which I refer to again and again, it's accompanied by Park Woon's marvelous sketches of these figures. There are 17 in this volume, and there are another 21 in the second volume. The second volume continues this examination of theory, but completely changes modality. Prominent theorists remain the focus, but the emphasis on anthropology is its comparative dimension. He shifts modality completely. As Pakun argues in his introduction, Anthropology makes no sense if it is not comparative. Ethnography without comparison is pointless, a position to which Pakun gives great emphasis. So it's interesting, Sejanatari Anthropology, published in Pakun's retirement, is more than just an introductory text. It represents Pakun's considered judgments on a range of theorizing arrived at over the long career. It's almost can be read as his summation volume of his concept of what anthropology is about. And as I said, it has this beautiful, has 21 portraits and it begins with a homage to his supervisor at Yale, Ed Bruner. It is entirely focused on, or not entirely, it is mainly focused on the Masab America. It ranges widely, considers a variety of forms of comparison, beginning with Murdoch's cross-cultural comparisons, Benedict and Mead, uh, Cluckham's comparison of values, and goes on and on and on. I won't, I won't go on. And, and. For Pakun, all comparison had to be built on sound foundations of good, quality ethnography, an essential research activity he urged his students to pursue. In his contribution to Aspect Manusia, Dalam Penaliti on Masyarakat, which came out in 82, and he published with Don Emerson, he describes his own fieldwork. Extended fieldwork in 58, 59, 
as a native ethnographer among a rice and sinkong farming population of Javanese in the southern Sarayu Highlands near Karanganya. Then his brief period of just two months as what he calls a complete stranger. He says, Sorang Asin Samaskali, among an ethnic, a multi-ethnic Sago gathering population in a swampy region of the northern coast of Yurian. And then another, another period of field work as an acculturated and linguistically fluent ethnographer in a fishing village in Iselmeer in the Netherlands. Of these ethnographic efforts, it was the study of Java that was the most important. Bakun's study of Java was more than just an ethnographic pursuit. It was a lifetime's engagement with Javanese culture, Kabudayan Jawa. Kabudayan Jawa is the culmination of this engagement. It was first, it was prepared in English and published in both in Indonesian and English and is historically oriented, ethnographically attuned examination of Javanese social and cultural life, the byproduct of immense knowledge based on extensive bibliographic survey of previous research on Java, repeated stints of personal field work and a lifetime's involvement in Javanese ways. However, in his introduction, he evokes the Masab America and explains that he has adopted Robert Redfield's concept of greater and lesser traditions of culture. He does this by distinguishing between pe Javanese peasant culture and Javanese urban culture. He also delves into the ideas of Javanese religion, distinguishing between Agami Jawi, Jawa Agami Jawi, and Agami Islam, Santri. Notions that he had wrestled with from the time of his first publication in a variety of other pub in a variety of other publications. I'll just check the time. How are we doing? Right? It's gonna go on. Sabar. Sabar. Jangan putus asa. Mahasi. Mahasi. Mahasi Okay. Akun lived a peripatetic academic life. Besides traveling among different universities in Indonesia, he was invited as a distinguished visitor by many academic institutions. In addition to his time as a research associate at the University of, of Pittsburgh in 61, 62, and as a visit, uh, Pakun was a, guest, <clears throat> was a guest lecturer, a guest professor at the University of Utrecht, a visiting scholar at Columbia University, University of Illinois, Ohio University, University of Wisconsin, and University of California, Berkeley. Lamayan. He was also a fellow of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC, the Netherlands Center for Advanced Study in, in Vassenaar, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, and the École des Institutes en Sciences Sociales. That is an extraordinary diversity of invitations and involvements. He was invited twice to the ANU, initially in 1973 and again in 1985. Pada waktu Pakun datang ke ANU pada tahun 85 untuk kunjungi Department of Anthropology the Research School of Pacific Studies, beliau tinggal di University House, mendapat kantor di Coombs Building dan meng habiskan sebagian besar waktunya dengan melakukan penelitian di perpustakaan Menzies Library. Tiga, ketiga bangunan yang saling berdekatan dan dapat didatangi dengan berjalan kaki. Pada waktu itu, koleksi perpustakaan Menzies mengenai Indonesia tak ada tandingnya. Dan Pakun meneliti sumber-sumber acuan yang, tidak, yang diperlukan namun tidak terdapat di Jakarta. Walaupun Pakun kerja keras, masih ada kesempatan untuk bertemu dan bicara. Kenangan yang paling berkesan ada tentara, dan tentang malam terakhir Pakun sebelum beliau kembali ke Jakarta. Malam itu ternyata merupakan tanggal penting dalam sejarah 
Canberra. Kunjungan Pakun ke Canberra dilakukan saat musim panas yang luar biasa panas dan kering. Pada waktu itu Pakun harus pada waktu Pakun harus pulang, Canberra sudah menjadi sangat kering dan kebakaran uh, hebat terjadi di Mount Majura, salah satu bukit di ujung utara Canberra. Malam sebelum Pak Kun mau pulang, saya dan istri saya mengundang Pak Kun makan malam. Setelah makan malam, kami naik mobil ke puncak Red Hill di sebelah selatan Canberra untuk menyaksikan api kebakaran di Mount Majura merangkak turun bukit. It's a beautiful, amazing, scary sight. Scary. Pak Kun dapat melihat sendiri ancaman kebakaran hutan, bushfires-nya itu, di ibu kota yang disebut Bush Capital, Australia. Kebakaran hutan itu merupakan kejadian yang sudah sekarang berulang sejak waktu itu sampai kini, dan semakin mengancam. Peristiwa bersejarah ini, kebakaran Mount Majura pada hari, hari Sabtu 2 Maret, 85 menandai hari terakhir Pak Kun di Canberra. Tapi satu, satu anekdot mengungkapkan sisi lain Pak Kun. Beberapa waktu setelah beliau kunjungi Canberra, saya kunjungi Jakarta dan hubungi Pak Kun. Dan biasanya kalau saya sampai Jakarta, saya hubungi Pak Kun. Pada waktu itu Pak Kun mengundang saya untuk bersamanya menghadiri seminar tertutup mengenai Irian Jaya. Pak Kun pernah melakukan penelitian lapangan di pesisir utara Irian pada tahun 6364 dan tetap menaruh perhatian pada etnografi Papua. Saya sendiri tidak memiliki keahlian mengenai antropologi Irian, akan tetapi saya menyambut undangannya karena beliau meminta saya ikut. Saya tidak terlalu ingat pada isi seminar ini, tetapi waktu pelaksanaannya penting. Seminar tertutup itu diselenggarakan tidak lama setelah pembunuhan Arnold App, antropolog, musisi, dan kurator Museum Cenderawasi. Di antara yang hadir ada beberapa perwira tinggi militer. Dan saya kira ini seminarnya diurus oleh militer. Pada sesi terakhir, sesi, pada sesi terakhir, pada peserta sudah mencut menjadi kelompok kecil yang mengeliling duduk di samping sebuah meja dan dipimpin oleh seorang perwira tinggi. Seingat saya, Pak Kun tak banyak bicara di sesi-sesi lain. Tetapi pada sesi terakhir, dengan suara yang tenang dan halus, Pak Kun bicara langsung kepada perwira itu yang memimpin diskusi. Ia mengancam tindakan, tindakan militer sebagai hal yang secara moral tidak benar. Patut dikecam secara sosial dan merupakan kebodohan strategis. Pak Kun bicara dengan jelas dengan sikap tegas, penuh wewenang. Setelah selesai, perwira yang mengkepalai pertemuan itu berdiam. Berdiam saja dan nutup seminar. Pak Kun sudah ungkapkan pandangannya sebagai tuduhan yang kena. Nah, itu such a memory is extraordinary. For me, that was one of the most extraordinary memories I have of Baku, because I know no one who would dare to do what he did. 
I'm going to cut some more things out, but I hope someday you can look at the, the, the publication and see all the footnotes you missed, okay? The creation of the Associación Antropología Indonesia in, town, uh, in, in 1983, uh, Douglas Mart, was another landmark in the development of anthropology in Indonesia. The names of its founders compri comprise a distinguished list. In addition to Pakun, these founders included Usman Peli, Matulada, Budi Santoso, Mircea Suat. Sorry, Mirta uh, Suasono, Kartini Panjaitan Shahir, Yulfita Raharjo, Edi Masinambo, Shafri Sairin, and PM Laks Laksono. Excuse me. During his career, Pakun was the recipient of many honors. He was twice awarded the the Satya Lanchana Uija Sista, both in 1968 and 1982. The Bintang Jasa Utama, 1994. Honorary doctorate by the University of Utrecht in 76. Lecture of the year in 1968 by the Association of Southeast Asian Institutions of Higher Learning and the Pengharian Ilmu, Ilmu Social in 1997 by the Indonesian Association for the Development of the Social Sciences. In 1995, he was awarded the Fukuoka Asian Cultural Prize and Sri Paduka Paku Alam Delapan conferred upon him the title of pa uh, Kanjeng Pangeran Ariam which is a title of all the Mataram courts. Pakun officially retired on the 15th of June, 1988. When he retired, the next generation was in its place at UI. James Dananjaya, Mircea Swasono, Budi Santoso, Parsudi Suparlan, Yunus Melatoa, were all professors in the Judosan Anthropology at the University of Indus. Theo Iromi was professor in the Faculty of Law, a faculty that has always had, since its very beginning, a connection with anthropology. E, importantly, E. Gusti Ngurabagus was professor at Udayana, Matulada at Hasanuddin, Usman Peli at Ikip uh, Medan. And the succeeding generation of eventual, eventual, this is the next generation now, eventual professors of anthropology were also in place. Amri, Mar, Amri Marzali and Yunita uh, Winarto were lecturers, docent at UI. Solistio Iri, Irianto was the docent in the Faculty of Law, and Shafri Sairin and PM Laksono were both docents, just docents at that time in Gajamada. Okay, I'm going to, again, I'm shortening things. So there's so much good stuff to read when you eventually look at the, the document. In 1964, Parkun and Stin moved to Jalan Daxi Napati Timur Nomor Samila, a house on the University of Indonesia campus in Rawamangu. His presence, their presence there for virtually the whole of Pakun's career made that house the center of anthropology in Indonesia. It was the workplace, it was his workplace and where he met with students and colleagues. He was also the home where he and Steen raised their children and where grandchildren could gather. It was in this house that Pakun died, and from there that he was eventually taken to be buried. All who knew him recognized him as a remarkable scholar, teacher, colleague, artist, friend, and above all, a refined and gentle prince among men. Sat Pakun wafat pada tanggal 2 April 1999. 
ठीक है ना ओके ओके dia meninggalkan satu warisan yang terus bertumbuh dan kembang ia merupakan pangkal pohon yang besar dengan banyak cabang yang ujungnya terus bersemi senyatanya semua antropolog Indonesia dari generasi masa kini mempunyai genealogi intelektual secara langsung atau tidak langsung yang kembali ke parakum This vast genealogy has yet to be traced, as indeed the full history of anthropology in Indonesia has yet to be explored, recorded, and properly documented. Although Pakun drew upon the Masa of America, he tempered his interpretation of anthropology by always giving it a cast that extended its creative outlook. He was intent on directing his students to the universities around the world And while the American universities were prominent in that, Dutch, British, and Australian Japanese universities contributed to the fundamental international orientation of Indonesian anthropology. As a result, Indonesian anthropology is multi-grounded and possesses the same great diversity of interests and characteristics of anthropology in the world. If you really consider it, it occurred to me last night thinking about this, the diversity of anthropology in Indonesia is greater than that diversity in America or in, in Australia or Britain. The diversity because it comes from every part of the world. Pakun's insistence that anthropology contribute to the development of the Indonesian, Indonesian nation has given it a public orientation that is problem directed and critically active. Pakun's view of anthropology as integral component of the social science in general has allowed anthropology and all its practitioners to engage in interdisciplinary cooperation. The comprehensive ethnographic monograph on a particular society has given way to problem-focused studies on, on a range of issues, environmental concerns, agriculture, forestry, maritime work, medicine, health research, problems of gender equity, marginality, done line line. All these tendencies also inform global anthropology. Pakun was determined to see that the creation of anthropology departments throughout the country. Those he founded and others that have subsequently been established have tended to promote research in their particular regions. Through a continuing series of biannual conferences organized at the behest of the journal Anthropology, local anthropologi anthropological practitioners are able to meet each other and learn of each other's work. Netrets, networks of mutual interests exist among many anthropologists, but these efforts do not themselves give the field an essential comparative dimension. Much of the most important work by anthropologists is now conducted through consultancies. Given the general grounding of anthropology and its flexibility, these consultancies are carried out on a variety of topics. The findings, much of this research remains restricted and often unpublished. The research is useful, practical, and varied. There's great theoretical scope to anthropology as practiced in, 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 in Indonesia, but most research papers tend to make a reference to some part of the greater anthropological masab as they are expected to do under national guidelines. And then they go on to concentrate on some very specific local analysis. Although somewhat baffling to the outsider, the Brin website Sinta provides a glimpse of the extent of anthropological teachings in Indonesia. There are 22 universities from Papua to Aceh plus a couple of universities that combine anthropology and sociology and that offer, that offer S S1 instruction in anthropology. Of these universities, seven, and only seven, offer master's degree S2, and three offer S3, University of Indonesia, Gajah Mada, and Hasanuddin. The task for the next generation of anthropologists is to continue to contribute to the creative national culture, especially as the boundaries between culture expand 
and the distinction between local, national, and international culture diminishes. Sayapurchaya, Pawa Warisan Pakun, Yang Tornyata, Malampai, Patas Basas, Rana Akademi. Sumbangan utamanya ada pagi kehidupan bangsa Indonesia pada umum. Wujud antropologinya yang disebar luas telah menjadi sumber inspirasi bagi beragam generasi Indonesia. Dalam acara peringatan ini, kita semua dapat mengakui sumbangan pakuan pada kebudayaan nasional yang terbuka, terikat, tolerant, dan kreatif. Kita semua sepatutnya mengucapkan terima kasih kepada seorang guru, pembimbing, toko intelektual yang bernama secara sederhana Pakun. Ya, terima kasih. Saya mundur dari ini, duduk sampai sana. Baik, terima kasih Prof. James Fox yang sudah menceritakan secara lengkap kehidupan pribadi maupun profesional dari Pak Kun. Ya, Pak Kun, baik. Uh, Bapak dan Ibu, uh, tadi uh, Prof. Jo Prof. James Fox juga sudah, sudah menceritakan pada kita uh, apa ya namanya dasar-dasar fondasi-fondasi antropologi yang Pak Kun sudah tanamkan di uh, di Indonesia dengan beberapa karyanya yaitu manusia dan kebudayaan antara lain. Uh, kita juga tahu bahwa beberapa buku-buku beliau itu uh, mencakup tidak hanya mengenai teori dan konsep antropologi, tetapi juga mendorong kita untuk menurut Prof. James Fox adalah mendorong kita untuk antropologi untuk terus membantu di dalam pembangunan bangsa dan di, uh, selalu memperhatikan hubungan uh, kebudayaan antara lokal, nasional, dan internasional. Baik, uh, kita masih punya waktu, Budante, kita masih punya waktu kira-kira 55 menit ya. 55 menit untuk tanya-jawab. Saya akan membuka untuk sesi yang pertama, tiga dulu ya pertanyaan, tiga dulu pertanyaan supaya bisa segera dijawab oleh Prof. James Fox, kemudian nanti kalau ada waktu lagi eh, dibuka lagi sesi berikutnya. Namun mohon agar lebih banyak me, eh, apa namanya peserta yang mendapat kesempatan untuk bertanya langsung saja pada pertanyaannya, jadi tidak perlu di mendapat kata pengantar gitu ya. Kalau boleh saya mohon supaya ada lebih banyak yang bisa uh, bertanya sehingga kita juga bisa mendapat lebih banyak pengetahuan tentang uh, Bapak kita Kuncara Ningrat. Baik, sesi pertama silakan siapa yang akan bertanya. Iwan, Dave, siapa lagi? Belum ada? Ah, Pak Mas Dedi ya. Baik. ke Pak Iwan dulu, Mbak Mas, Pak Iwan, kemudian Pak Dev dan kemudian Pak Dedi. Terima kasih, terima kasih, terima kasih Pak James. Banyak hal yang saya baru dengar dengan sistematik cerita tentang Pak Hun. Saya mau bertanya karena penasaran, karena kami yang kuliah di Antropologi UI tidak pernah sekalipun berkuliah dengan Pak Kun uh, karena sudah pensiun waktu saya kuliah. Jadi pertanyaan saya, saya ingin bertanya uh, untuk zaman sekarang dan seterusnya, apakah ada perlu harus dilakukan suatu perubahan di, di kurikulum antropologi UI menurut Bapak? Karena saya melihat dimensi historical sejarah itu kurang begitu dibuka atau di, di, diwajibkan dalam dalam 
kegiatan akademik di antropologi dalam level skripsi ya biasanya bicara tentang latar belakang tapi historinya sangat kurang sekali jadi itu men, uh, juga pertanyaan kedua apakah sudah saatnya perlu beralih sedikit dari tradisi Amerika itu untuk cari sejarah bangsa sendiri mungkin ke Belanda karena banyak yang kami tidak tidak tahu pengalaman kolonial dan dampaknya kepada kebudayaan kami di Indonesia. Terima kasih. Ini saja. Baik, udah. Ya, terima kasih Pak Iwan. Ah, saya campur, campur bahasa, uh, because you've asked an old man from another generation how the new curriculum should be. And I think that's probably inappropriate. Um, it's for this generation to begin to think, okay, different this way. Let me, let me, let me do it. In another way, saya seorang order lama, and the first lesson that I learned from Sukarno pada saat saya tiba di sini is berdiri di atas kaki sendiri, and I believe that is a good principle for Indonesia. I actually think that more often than not. Indonesia berdiri di atas kaki sendiri. But two dimensions to your questions. It's such a good question. Two dimensions. First, it's for the present generation to work out what it is they want to develop in anthropology. As an elder, I think it is useful I think it's sangat penting to draw upon the past generations. I would say, as we used to have at the ANU and we don't have any more, a history of anthropology course that was required for all students who concentrated in anthropology. In this case, and I'm saying this Really, truly, those two books of Pakun, Sejarah Anthropology, uh, Sejarah Anthropology, Jilid Satu dan Jilid Dua, are one of the very best, best ways of understanding past anthropology. And not necessarily to be repeated, but to understand, because they're, first of all, they're personal. He looks at anthropology from the creators of their different schools, and he looks at the different schools. So one recommendation I would say to everyone, reread, before you make any decision, reread Sajara 1 and 2. They're, they, I reread them. I reread them, and I like his, he was superbly, able to encompass the key ideas of different figures in anthropology very well. Maybe no one has done it for Levi-Strauss, okay? Levi-Strauss is a little weak in, 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 in Sajara 1, but then no one understands Levi-Strauss, okay? But apart from, apart from Levi-Strauss, uh, the, the summaries are good. So, a, I'm saying, work out what anthropology should be. This is the generation to do it. But look back at those two books by Pa Kun to understand what anthropology once was. Now, I'm going to add something else. So I draw out the time. I'm, I'm not going to draw out. Uh, I said, I said that um, the time of the single volume ethnography on a particular culture, Sudalewa. And if we look at anthropology now, 
it's a rare volume that does that. But I think, I mean, from my personal point of view, those volumes are still the best of the volumes. They are still the best of the volumes. And I keep saying to my students, those are the volumes that will have a half-life of at least 50 years. You write about, it, it could be a contemporary culture, you too, Orang Batawi, Sagarang Ini, but a really good comprehensive account of Satuka Budaya, Apasaji. You bequeath that to the next generations. If someone wants to know what was it like living in this culture or that culture. So I'm, I still am an advocate of that, but I recognize that in general, in anthropology, that is hamper, hamper mahogila. So it's, it's, not, it's not an adequate answer, but I'm glad you asked the question. Thank you. Silakan Pak Dave, selanjutnya. Ya, selamat siang Pak James. Uh, ya sebenarnya itu pertanyaan ini agak terkait dengan pertanyaan Iman tadi. Um, karena Pak James tadi kan berbicara bahwa Pak Kun punya perhatian yang sangat besar pada sejarah hmm. di awal-awal menulis. Nah mungkin yang terkait dengan juga pertanyaan Iman adalah kenapa analisis sejarah itu hilang di kurikulum antropologi pada saat kita kuliah gitu ya. Nah menurut Pak James itu apakah itu adalah pengaruh dari iklim politik di Indonesia saat itu atau apakah menurut pengamatan Pak Jim itu adalah pengaruh dari mas dari mashab yang akhirnya menjadi uh, established di Indonesia mungkin itu aja terima kasih Pak Jim oke okay. again but yeah, a very good question I cannot answer why the historical approach is disappearing in the in the in the curriculum um, and i'm not sure whether that is true everywhere but i strongly believe that well okay i'll go back one of my great gurus at oxford was evans pritchard And Evans Pritchard would always say, anthropology is only contemporary history. He always saw that anthropology was part of history. And he made that very strong theoretical position. You can read Evans Pritchard on why anthropology and, and history, harus diangkap satu. Harus diangkap satu. Now, It's my belief that that's true, and that's the way I was trained. And one example, um, one example is I went to this Polosot. You couldn't have chose almost, it would have been hard to choose a more obscure island in Indonesia to do research, Pulau Rote. Tapi kebetulan, Roti figured so prominently in the history of that whole region, the whole Timor region. It was more important than any other island for 200 years. And that meant, I didn't expect to do it, that meant that when I finished my PhD thesis, I had to go, I moved to Leiden and started doing research on the Arsif in Flanda, the Feose. The Feose archives, every year, Tampa Kechewale, there's a report on Roti and what's going on Roti. And I had to golly all that information. Now, that was, it was fortunate for me that There are literally hundreds, if not thousands of pages written about Pulau Roti in the Abad Tujubalas, Abad Dulapan Balas, and Nine Line. But every culture in Indonesia has a deep historical foundation. If you treat 
contemporary culture without, without that historical foundation, you're talking about a pohon and you're not describing its aka. Huh? You're, tra- you're, you're describing down, down, but you're not talking about the aka. In my view, every culture, you begin with its aka. Lagi, I'll answer one further. Much of my research in the last 10 years has shifted, I would not say, not out of Indonesia, because Indonesia is the pusat, but has shifted to the study of comparative Austronesian studies. I'm looking at all of the Austronesian people, whether that is in Jawa or in, in, in Manado or in Madagascar or in Hawaii and what they share in South. One of the things that every single Austronesian culture that we know of has is a concern with its own origins. Some of them are, most of them are mythic, huh? but the mythic origins also inform contemporary life. So I see, as I think, I hope your question was leading to, that history is absolutely essential to doing good ethnography and doing good comparative ethnography. Baik, thank you, Prof. James. Silakan Pak Dedi. Terima kasih. Uh, ya, saya termasuk generasi yang kurang beruntung sebenarnya masuk antropologi. Angkatan 82 masuk, Pak Kun sudah tidak mengajar lagi di S1. Jadi saya tidak pernah mendapatkan kuliah Pak Kun di dalam kelas. Tapi saya kira saya beruntung hari ini setelah Pak Jim membaca karya-karya Pak Kun dan uh, termasuk personalnya juga dan menempatkan karya-karya Pak Kun di dalam konteks uh, global discourse of anthropology, anthropology of Indonesia dan juga dinamika atau perkembangan pengajaran antropologi di Indonesia. Nah, pertanyaan saya mendekati kedua pertanyaan sebelumnya, tapi Mungkin dalam redaksi yang lain, kalau seumpamanya Pak Kun masih ada di kita dan besok hari menyelenggarakan ulang tahun ke seratusnya dan kita diund- dan Pak Kun diundang atau kita mengadakan acara seperti ini, setelah Pak Ji membaca karya-karya beliau dan juga membaca personal history-nya, kira-kira Pak Kun akan mengatakan apa? untuk antropologi, antropologi Indonesia, dan antropologi di UI khususnya. Terima kasih. Saya so okay. Saya bisa jawab dengan singkatnya, saya bukan pakun. Untungnya saya tidak pakun, jadi saya tidak bisa jawab. Tapi itu kan, itu kita, itu hampir pertanyaan orang rote ini sudah ada, ini ada ekornya. <laughs> Semua kalau bicara dengan orang rote seluruh ketemu dengan itu ekornya. Oke. Okay. Masalahnya, dan ini it, terus terang, I don't know the curriculum sekarang. Tetapi, Dedi mengajar di di Ponorogo. Dari bagaimana melihat kurikulum? Apakah kurikulum di di Ponorogo, antropologi di Ponorogo, sangat berbeda dengan antropologi yang sekarang misalnya di UI atau di Gajah Mada? Saya kurang tahu. Is it very different? What tell me? Is it so different? Is there is what is the what is the what is the lack that you see? I don't because you're asking me to comment on something I don't know. Okay, but say say something, Daddy. (laughs) 
Saya nggak tahu saya punya hak untuk bicara ini atau enggak kan? Ya 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 ya. Saya silakan. Monggo 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 monggo. Tahu persis sebenarnya apa yang ada di dalam itu. Tapi saya tadi saya mengatakan juga ini masalah mengkoneksi apa materi materi kuda dengan dinamika realita di apa lapangan maupun kebijakan pemerintah yang saya lihat masih belum nyambung dan saya kira masih belum dapat penekanan yang cukup dari pengajaran di Oke. Nah, itu sih. Iya, itu this question. Jadi kira-kira Pak pun akan mengatakan itu juga ya. Baik. Ya, baik. Eh, apalagi tiga dulu ya, Mas Imam, terus Pak Ibu Suraya ya. Kemudian satu lagi ada uh, Mbak, nanti sebut namanya lengkap ya, Mbak. Baik. Terima kasih. Eh, uh, silakan Pak Imam. Terima kasih. Saya berbeda dengan Iwan kuliah di awal tahun 2000, Iwan di tahun 90-an. Uh, Pak Jim, sekarang saya ketua program studi S1, jadi mungkin saya bisa cerita kurikulum, tapi saya kan nggak bisa cerita banyak-banyak. Oh, 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 oh. Tapi sebelum masuk ke hal itu, saya ingin mendengar pendapat Pak Jim. Selama pengamatan Pak Jim sejak Pak Kun mengembangkan antropologi Indonesia, apakah kita sudah memiliki mazhab antropologi Indonesia? Mazhab pemikiran. School of Thought dari Indonesian Anthropology. Apakah Pak Jim melihat itu? Apakah Pak Jim melihat ada yang tidak jelas? Which direction the ininya? Social uh, sebagai School of Thought. Kita bisa berefleksi, tapi sepengamatan saya ada di dalam antropologi 20 tahun terakhir, saya tidak pernah uh, apa? pernah mendengar gitu percakapan apa sih mazhab antropologi Indonesia karena tadi Pak James bilang ada mazhab Amerika yang dibawa oleh Pak mungkin itu dulu oke okay. baik itu sebenarnya lebih gampang menjawab menurut saya menurut saya sudah saya tidak melihat lagi satu mazhab Amerika lagi terpecah dan saya malahan saya tidak melihat masa global lagi. Sudah ada banyak aliran-aliran di dalam bidang antropologi internasional sekarang. Banyak aliran. Dan tak mungkin seorang mahasiswa yang masuk di, di antropologi bisa kuasai semua aliran. Saya harus memilih. Ada beberapa sifat ya, antropologi yang akan tetap participant observation ya, dan ethnographic, ethnographic perception, apakah comparative dimension, But there is no one way of comparing anymore. Um, so I don't think we can acknowledge a, a single mass up. But that answers the next question. I, I personally don't see a mass up in Indonesia. Huh? It's very hard to see a mass up in Indonesia. I would like to see a mass up in Indonesia. Um, before COVID, dan sekarang saya harus bagi dunia saya di antara before and after COVID. But before COVID, uh, I was teaching here satu mata kuliah dalam comparative Austronesia. Um, itu merupakan satu comparative approach. Uh, bagi saya sangat berguna untuk understand the, the dimensions of the cultures of Indonesia. But that approach 
memang mungkin terdapat di beberapa universitas sementara, but there is not, it is not a dimension I see that is developing in, in, in here or elsewhere in Indonesia. Um, so we are multi the mouth anthropologue tampa masa and it's going to be your generation huh? or the generation that follows young visa visa manchipta kan satu dimensi i don't know if anyone can create a masa like huh? the change in the world the way knowledge is, exists now um I don't think we can, but if there's anyone ambitious enough to create a masab, yeah, slaka, java, that's good. Because what happens, and I think, Hakun saw that huh? in his Sajara, Sajara Jilid Kedua, he looks at the Verbage mas, Macham uh, theories of in anthropology. Um, and those, he is able to describe them without committing to them, but showing that one of the, maybe the, the at that time, Adasaitu, what was very important was the creativity that was coming out of America in so many different kinds of schools of thought. I don't see that anymore, but I don't, I look for new streams of thought. Um, and, you know, I look, you're going to have to find it. Okay. Yeah, mungkin sedikit. Okay, okay, sedikit. okay. Just five minutes, karena Pak Jim tadi penasaran kurikulum dan nampaknya selalu muncul dari pertanyaan floor. Saya seperti gergetan di depan. Jadi, uh, what is, uh, apa, saya kebetulan sebelum mengampu Prodi S1 dan sebelum kembali studi doktoral di Jerman, mengampu kelas antropologi Indonesia yang pertama dibuka Pak Iwan dan Pak Amri, kalau nggak salah ya, idenya. Betul Pak Amri? Uh, dan sewaktu itu, itu seperti pemanasan untuk mengetahui pada pada titik mana kita seharusnya melanjutkan dan merubah apa yang sudah dikembangkan Pak Kun. Dan waktu itu kelas antropologi Indonesia eh, dengan Div juga waktu itu menjadi seperti berefleksi dan mengumpulkan dan mengkurasi karya-karya eh, antropologi Indonesia. Ini refleksi saya yang nampaknya berdampak juga saya rasa terhadap apa itu kurikulum dan antropologi di Indonesia. Pertama, semenjak Pak Kun, tidak ada suksesi yang mengarahkan pengembangan antropologi karena dari situ many pendekar di kita. <laughs> Jadi ada Pak Parsudi, ada Pak Niko. Ya. Ini refleksi saya berkuliah waktu itu. Dan rumor ini sering beredar. Dan sepiu big man. Ya. Tapi uh, mereka pun nampaknya memiliki ceruk-ceruknya sendiri. Uh, they have their own theoretical niche. Dan dia juga punya aspirasi dan engagement dengan publik yang berbeda-beda. So, satu ini Pak Iwat Citra misalnya, lebih mendekat ke masyarakat sipil, NGO, and social movement. Sementara ada yang melanjutkan ke state-driven uh, uh, expectation, what antropologi should be. Sementara juga berkembang pandangan-pandangan yang berbeda. So, jadi dari kelas itu kemudian saya berefleksi dan membawa itu seingat saya dalam rapat kurikulum. Maka memang tadi pertanyaan yang genuin saya ingin tanya dari pandangan orang luar ke Pak apakah ada? Nampaknya sepertinya saya juga mengalami itu. Dan memang eh, keragaman yang terjadi dalam regenerasi antropologi setidaknya yang saya tangkap dari apa yang di UI itu juga adalah keragaman dua hal. Training antropologi yang berbeda, kita yang Amerika semakin sedikit, tapi saya train Europe dengan beberapa dosen lain, dan juga engagement dengan publik yang berbeda dan pilihan politik yang berbeda. Jadi jika memang ada yang ingin melanjutkan wacana pembangunan kebudayaan, ada juga di kita. 
Tapi bagi yang memiliki aspirasi politik yang berbeda, ada juga. Dan akhirnya mewarnai kurikulum kami. Dan juga akhirnya menjelaskan engagement kita ke publik apa. Mungkin itu refleksi saya. Mungkin di masa pakun ada sedikit berbeda. Mungkin demikian. Mudah-mudahan jadi cukup. Nah, uh, saya kenal di ANU mengajar uh, sejarah antropologi sebagai salah satu pernah dan tidak selalu kan sudah hampir hilang dari kurikulum di ANU juga tapi kan pernah dulunya saya mengajar sejarah antropologi tetapi dan biasa dengan bukan sendirian karena pada Dulu kalau juga saya rasanya saya tidak bisa kuasai semua macam antropologi. Tapi pada kelas pertama dan ternyata jatuh kepada kelas kedua, saya mulai gambarkan intellectual genealogy yang saya mempunyai. Oke. Okay. Saya berdiri di, di muka mahasiswa mahasiswa. Oke, okay. saya punya supervisor salah satunya Rodney Needham. Apa yang saya dapat dari Rodney Needham kan gini gini gini. Dia dapat dari siapa? Dia diambil dari siapa? Oke, okay, Levi Strauss sudah ada di sini. Padahal Yasmin Dion di sini. Tapi itu sebagian dari 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 intelektual gini lagi saya dari sudut lain, misalnya. Saya profesor yang pertama yang mempunyai ajaran yang menarik saya masuk antropologi itu dan seorang nama Clyde Clacom. Clyde Clacom dan Clyde Clacom memang satu inspirasinya dan Oke, okay, saya mau tidak mau saya harus bilang dia termasuk intellectual genealogy saya. Dia dapat intellectual di mana? Oke, okay, ikutnya ke Kroger ataupun ini. Ternyata lagi karena saya di Harvard sebelum saya ke Oxford, saya juga banyak belajar di dari seorang yang uh, Doug Oliver yang Pacific. Padahal dia the PhD dari Austria. Jadi oke, okay, saya kan tambah gitu. Tapi setelah saya membuka intellectual genealogy yang yang begini, 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 dan blackboard sudah menjadi penuh dengan nama-nama orang, oke? Okay? Dan intellectual genealogy kita all share multiple genealogies. Right? Tentunya kalau pada waktu itu saya bisa masukkan bakun, karena banyak ajaran yang saya sebenarnya ambil dari bakun. Uh, dan saya menghargai, terus terang saya menghargai ada orang yang bilang sudah sudah terlalu out of touch, but I, saya menghargai kebudayaan Jawa. Selalu ada on my desk. Because if I want to know anything about Jawa, akan saya, akan, tidak akan banyak, tapi mungkin satu paragraf, dua paragraf yang sangat penting huh, untuk diketahui. And I use that. Okay, so it's quite a chunk. But then I would invite another colleague. Yeah, okay. You put your intellectual genealogy. So, Paya, my sister, my sister, so the canal kepada orang yang mengajar pada mereka nanti, mereka akan tahu, oh, he's in the intellectual genealogy, inspirasi in the beginning, in, in, in. So, that was a way of introducing all of the colleagues. Huh? In the department, pada satu something to be hadir saya 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 trace their genealogy, huh? uh, Professor Sons, oh my God, in, in, in. Okay. Maka saya kira that is a better way of recognizing sejarahnya yang kita semua mempunyai. Kita tidak masing-masing mempunyai intellectual genealogy berbeda. Tetapi there is a great deal of similarities in the genealogies we share. Thank you. Terima kasih, Pak James Hock. Um, ada sesuatu yang saya pengen tanya. Implikasi, kan begini. 
Departemen Antropologi beda dengan Amerika, beda dengan Australia. Di Indonesia, Departemen Antropologi kemudian ada di Fakultas Ilmu Sosial dan Politik, satu lagi ada di FIB. Nah, kalau di Amerika kan yang saya tahu itu satu fakultas memegang unit kalau kita American Anthropology kan ada di dalam satu fakultas di mana arkeologi, biologi, semua itu sosial ada dalam satu fakultas. Yeah. Nah, di Indonesia itu terbelah. Satu ada di ilmu sosial dan politik, satu lagi ada di fakultas sastra. Ya. arkeologinya di sana, sosial antropologi di sini, ada yang begini-begini. Nah, itu implikasinya apa dan kalau kita komparatif dengan misalnya yang Pak James tahu di Australia, apakah ada implikasi di dalam juga uh, arrangement itu? Saya pengen dapat komparatif itu sepengat observasinya Pak James. Oke, okay. baik. Oh, these always another good question and very tepat juga, tepat juga. Dan um, dari pandangan saya, uh, saya seorang kalau dari sudut Amerika, saya produknya dari dari sistemnya seperti itu ada archaeology, anthropology, linguistics dan ya. Biasa tiga atau empat, ya. Um, and I very much like that. I, because that's the way I was trained, sometimes I do more linguistic work, and I was trained as a linguist, so many of my, if I do my intellectual genealogy, I do, uh, I have an intellectual genealogy. My, my great guru at, at, great guru at Harvard was uh, Roman Jakobsen. Then Bergaulingen linguists, I have a good linguistic genealogy because of this kind of curriculum that once existed. And I also follow archaeology very closely because it's very important. But I see, now I don't, I can't speak for the whole of the United States, but almost everywhere in the United States, these disciplines have split. Um, I went back to Harvard in 2007. Us, split between archaeology and anthropology and biological anthropology. Three chabang yang, they don't even want to have meetings together. Right? They can split secara intellectual, but it becomes very personal. Sangat personal. And mereka satu tidak mau kenal yang lain dan lain-lain. It's when they split, They split very, very, very badly. And I see in many places, I can't everywhere, many places in America that split. You take the opposite. You go to Britain, you have social anthropology, but rarely do you have any linguistics. Uh, and rarely do you have archaeology. They are hampir sepisa di Indonesia. They are quite separate. And there is in England an extreme constant, almost obsession with social anthropology and a unhealth. In, when I saw it in, in Oxford, for example, Oxford, an unhealthy attitude towards linguistic. Oh, we can't learn anything from linguistics, okay? Tutu matanya terhadap linguistics. Well, I, I, saya tidak terima itu. But you're right. You're absolutely right. The, the, the intellect, the university organization of these different disciplines affects the way students learn. And, and that's, I think, a fact of life, and only think now there are anthropology departments that are splitting as well because of the different aliran within their anthropology department. 
visited visit Stanford at some points. There's there was at, at one point the, the 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 same anthropologist who would, would you thought would be able to get on with each other could not because some were more qualitative, some were more quantitative, and the quantitative people didn't want to talk with the qualitative people. Sagitu. But that's almost the intellectual life and the, of, of the situation of knowledge as we have it now. Apalagi. Apalagi, okay, to solve all the problems or recognize all the problems of the world. Yeah. Split itu, split itu yang menjelaskan kenapa nggak bisa lagi satu mashab sekarang. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. no, no That's that yeah. explain the there is no mashab. Yeah. The uh, tension. What, what bothers me is if you tune back in as I tune back into America, I discover my friends who I thought were talking to each other are not talking to each other. Exactly. Right? And It's, the other, the other thing is the the racial debate in the United States and Canada, it's very bad. Yeah. Against white, against, I I felt not healthy. I against that. Okay. I, 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 I America, sorry, I'll, I'll say this, I'll say this, but America makes me very uncomfortable. I don't, I. How, how about Australia? We are in Australia. We're fighting. Huh? It's still a fight. It's 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 not resolved, but it is a fight. I think I I can't predict how it'll go. It's a fight. We have a very Australia's problem now. We I don't know if you realize it. We're coming up to a national referendum on the voice to parliament for the aborigines. Now, how that referendum goes in Australia will be extremely important for the character of the nation in the future. I was two months ago confident that it would go through. Now I'm not so confident. There are so many voices against the voice to parliament. So it's, a, as I say, that right now is a cultural fight of the highest importance in Australia. Thank you. Uh, yang, yeah. Ter yang terakhir ya, silakan. Uh, maaf tadi sudah duluan. Ya. Oh. Ya. Terima kasih. Uh, selamat siang. Saya Dian Yuli Astuti. Kebetulan saya awam untuk antropologi hanya pernah kena, uh, kenal antropologi waktu zaman sekolah dulu uh, sudah berapa puluh tahun yang lalu. Nah, yang ingin saya tanyakan keluar dari sedikit antropologi yang sedang dibahas Ibu Bapak sekalian semua ke Pak James. Mungkin saya pengen sedikit uh, tahu lebih lanjut terkulik uh, soal tadi apa cerita uh, Bapak bersama Pak Kun ketika seminar tertutup tentang Papua begitu. Ada apa namanya uh, pernyataan Pak Kun bahwa beliau mengecam uh, perwira yang memimpin uh, pertemuan itu atau seminar itu. Nah, bagaimana sebetulnya dasar Pak Kun akhirnya mengeluarkan sikap yang cukup kritis tentang hal itu gitu. Itu yang pertama, kemudian yang kedua waktu Solusi, apakah pada saat itu juga Pak Kun menawarkan semacam solusi bagaimana uh, pendapat apa, antropologi uh, yang ada saat itu untuk masyarakat Papua atau masyarakat yang ada saat itu begitu. Terus kemudian yang kedua, uh, yang ketiga tentang uh, tadi juga disampaikan tentang karya-karya Pak Kun adalah lanskap manusia Indonesia begitu. Nah. Uh, pada saat itu apakah ada keinginan lebih lanjut dari Pak Kun untuk melengkapi karya yang lebih eh, apa lebih spesifik tentang manusia Indonesia berikutnya begitu Pak itu saja terima kasih mohon maaf apabila ada pertanyaan yang kurang berkenan 
lindung saya kan gini gini. Okey, uh, pada sebahagian dari itu pertanyaan itu pakun pada anekdot yang saya ceritakan pakun bicara untuk sebentar saja. Dan kalau kita menurut saya it was powerful because it was direct but extremely reflective comprehensive it was if you talk about it in military terms it was a shot a short shot that read to the heart of this general or the colonel or whatever he was. I don't know these Bhagat yet. And it was effective. So effective that he could say nothing. And no one else wanted to say anything. It stopped. When you do that so effectively, tidak ada. Jalan lain kecuali dia. Okay. So, at this time, and as I said, I am no expert on Irian, and I have no, I don't know if Bakun ever offered a anthropological solution to Irian. I think the only thing, I cannot have any idea but the only thing is that it is a work in progress. Huh? And all I can say from my point of view, I have met many, many Orang Papua who I believe have the ability to carry things forward. So if there is going to be a solution. The solution will come from from those those people in Irian, in Papua itself. Let's say another thing, and this will get me into trouble. I think Irian, Indonesian Papua, is in better shape than Papua New Guinea. Papua Guinea, I am very worried about. Uh, we have much more to know about from Australia. We see Papua New Guinea. And I am very, very worried that Papua New Guinea, this is my view, is Manujuka chaos. And that whatever the problems in, in Indonesian Papua, it's not Manujuka chaos. I think Sayahara is Manuju Kabada Sati Solusi Yang Adil. But we see that um, it's just a personal opinion. Thank you. Uh, I kira cukup di jawabnya ya, Mbak. Baik, uh, Prof, bolehkah kita menjawab beberapa pertanyaan dari Zoom, dari peserta Zoom? Ini tadi di Zoom? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Jadi ada pertanyaan dari Repa Kustipia ya, Repa Kustipia. Selamat saya bacakan ya. Selamat siang Pak James, terima kasih paparannya. Pemikiran Pak Kuncaraningrat apakah masih relevan? Dengan perspektif antropologi masa kini, dengan dinamikanya yang semakin dinamis, karena saya mendalami antropologi pangan, amat sulit melenturkan elemen antropologi di Indonesia sendiri, dan perlu kajian lain yang melengkapi. Pada akhirnya, bermuara pada etnosentrisme, di mana ada eksklusivitas dan superioritas dari budaya itu sendiri sehingga tidak resilient menghadapi transformasi berbagai sektor kontemporer. Ah, 
akhirnya para antropolog yang punya permintaan khusus seperti sekarang di bidang antropologi atau antropologi lingkungan yang mengembangkan pemikiran kecerdasan buatan harus kembali pada hal-hal tradisional dan konservatif. Bagaimana menurut Prof. James? Karena kami masih muda, perlu banyak referensi. Uh, Repa Kustipia ini berasal dari Center for Study Indonesian Food Anthropology di Tasik Malaya. Terima kasih. Ya, terima, kasih. Ya, terima kasih. Seterusnya saya tidak cukup mengerti itu untuk menjawab. Pakai mic-nya. Tapi sebagai ini saya mungkin kurang mengerti pertanyaan itu supaya ya jadi untuk menjawab dengan jelas coba jelaskan itu. Jadi jadi mereka ini dari antropologi Pak. Ya. Mereka ada bikin data karena akhirnya sebetulnya penolakan di pada penolakan ada pendekatan pendekatan baru. Kalau nggak tahu gitu ya. Uh, ada, ada. Uh, ini bisa langsung bertanya. Oh baik, oh baik Ibu uh, dan Bapak James, uh, saya akan uh, menanyakan tentang so is the thinking of Mr. Kuncharaningrat still relevant in the perspective of contemporary anthropology with its increasingly dynamics? Because I'm uh, delving into the food anthropology or the anthropology of food, so it is very difficult. To incorporate anthropological, maaf, maaf, ya? maaf, bisa perlahan. Oh perlahan. baik, iya. oh baik bu, oh iya, oh, Dan baik. Tidak, ber, tidak terlalu dekat ke mikrofon ya. Oh baik, uh, saya ulangi lagi. Good afternoon, uh, Professor James. Thank you for your presentations. So I want to ask you about is the thinking of Mr. Kunchara Ningrat still relevant in the perspective of contemporary anthropology with its increasingly dynamics because I'm delving uh, into anthropology of food, so it is very difficult to incorporate the anthropological elements in Indonesia itself because uh, the additional studies are needed to complement it. So in the end, uh, it leads to ethnocentrisms uh, where there is exclusivity and superiority of the culture itself. So making it not resilience again in facing transformations in various contemporary sectors. So I think therefore the anthropological of food like me or the anthropological of the environmental or the ecological uh, anthropologists who are developing artificial intelligent thinking. So. So Mr. Kunchara Ningrat, uh, thinking should return to traditional and conservative approaches. So how does uh, Professor James respond to this phenomenon? Because yeah, we the younger generations, we need many references. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah, baik. Terima kasih. Uh, begini. Tentunya saya kira ini Ajarannya Pak Kun sangat relevan, apalagi untuk antropologi pangan. Dan tidak, saya kira tidak pernah pikiran Pak Kun konservatif, tapi dia selalu melihat pada perkembangan yang ada. Nah, kebetulan. Saya baru di sini beberapa hari, tiga, empat hari. Dan saya dapat ketemu dengan seorang uh, entrepreneur yang ciptakan bisnis, agrobisnis, agribisnis. Dan dia sedang memakai sago untuk membuat spaghetti. Dan sedang jual itu dengan dengan paketnya kecil-kecil yang akan saya membawa ke Australia. Karena tertarik sekali apakah semacam makanan Italia bisa dibuat 
dengan sago dari Papua. Tapi pusatnya untuk itu uh, ada di Jakarta. Bayangkan itu. Ada tradisi, ada hal-hal baru, pangan yang luar biasa. Dan itu satu contoh saya kira, Pak Kun sangat senang melihat perkembangan semacam itu. Apalagi pasti dia, dia kalau dia ada, dia mau coba makanan itu. Jadi saya kira Pak Kun pikirannya masih relevan dan lebih baik daripada kita bicara mengenai nasi saja atau ke yang jagung atau makanan lain, kita juga pakai bicara mengenai sago dan manfaatnya sago yang asal dari Papua. Jadi jawabannya Mbak Repa bahwa pemikiran Pak Kun itu masih bisa digunakan. Baik, ini waktunya sudah tepat pukul 16. Iya, e, sudah selesai Pak Amri waktunya. Bagaimana panitia saya ingin dengar? Oh, boleh, boleh Pak Amri. Pasti dalam pertanyaan itu silakan. Ini mohon maaf ini saya jadi kurang sopan kepada Pak Jen. Maaf Pak Jen ya. Ini Pak Jen ini guru saya ya. Sorry. Oke okay, begini. Saya tanya lagi dia. You tahu nggak antropologinya Pak Kun? Kok bisa bilang masa depannya nggak ada? Ya. Buku-buku Pak Kun yang terakhir bukan textbook ya. Maka kita bisa katakan Pak Kun itu alirannya antropologi pembangunan. Applied antropologi. Baca aja bukunya. Gitu. Ada di buku itu. Applied antropologi, antropologi terapan. Ada itu di buku itu. Faktor-faktor sosial budaya dalam pembangunan. Pembangunan kan. Itu aliran beliau ya. Dan itu tahun... Zaman Orde Baru ya, 70, 80 gitu kan. Di UI juga ada antropologi pembangunan jurusannya ya. Ya kan? Nah, anak saya satu lulus uh, ekonomi pembangunan. UI gitu. Sekarang asosiat profesor ekonomi di California State University di uh, Sonoma. Tapi ini bukan banggakan ya. Relevansinya, relevansinya begini. Jadi Pak Kun itu antropologi pembangunan, the, uh, applied antropologi. Terus saya bilang kemarin sama anak saya, terus kayaknya ekonomi pembangunan sudah sudah malap ya, nggak ada lagi orang ngomong itu sejak tahun 2010. Apa masih 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 ada? Ada dia bilang. Sekarang bukan ekonomi pembangunan, tapi Political ekonomi pembangunan sekarang di dalam itu. Jadi, ya tentu dia kan cukup, cukup up to date dong. Dia kan mengajar di Amerika kan ya. Maaf ini bukan memakan ya, cuma untuk memberitahu aja ya. Nah, jadi jawaban saya, apa yang Pak Kun punya pikiran pada tahun 70-80 tetap bisa dilanjutkan. Applied Anthropology. Dan kemarin saya melanjutkan menjadi Public Policy Anthropology. Itu ada buku saya. Public Policy Anthropology. Jadi itu jawaban saya. Pak Jepo, Pak Jepo. Oke, terima kasih. Baik. Terima kasih Prof. Amri Marsali. Baik, Bapak dan Ibu kita sudah sampai di penghujung waktu karena ini sudah pukul 16. Uh, Uh, apa kita sungguh berterima kasih sekali kepada Prof James Fox yang sudah menceritakan secara rinci uh, kehidupan pribadi maupun kehidupan profesional Prof Kuncara Ningrat dari diskusi-diskusi tadi kita belajar bahwa sebetulnya berbagai buku yang sudah dituliskan oleh 
Prof. Gencara Ningrat itu masih bisa digunakan sebagai rujukan dan uh, cukup baik untuk dipelajari, untuk kita memiliki pengetahuan mengenai konsep-konsep dan teori yang pernah ada. Dan uh, Prof. James menyarankan agar mengingat bahwa sekarang antropologi di UI sedang menyiapkan kurikulum, silakan menyiapkan sesuai dengan kondisi generasinya. Tetapi beliau juga menyampaikan bahwa pengetahuan mengenai sejarah sangat penting. Karena kalau kita tidak memahami sejarah, maka kita hanya meniti dari etnografinya, hanya etnografi dari daun-daun atau pohon, tetapi tidak memahami dari akarnya. Itu yang disampaikan oleh Prof. James. Mohon kesediaan Bapak dan Ibu untuk memberikan aplaus kepada Prof. James. Terima kasih, Prof. James. Saya mohon maaf apabila saya secara pribadi melakukan kesalahan yang kurang berkenan di Bapak dan Ibu. Terima kasih. Selamat sore. Terima kasih Mbak Nini. Eh, sebelum kita tutup acara, Pak James sama Mbak Nini tunggu dulu di situ ya. Duduk manis dulu karena akan foto dengan Ibu sebentar lagi tapi saya menutup acara dulu. Terima kasih. Eh, Bapak Ibu sekalian terima kasih atas kesabarannya untuk terus mengikuti eh, diskusi yang asik ini ya. Kayaknya kok nggak diberhentiin bisa sampai nanti malam. Tapi pasti juga udah pada lelah, jadi uh, kita akan selesai di sini. Tapi sebelumnya saya akan mengingatkan bahwa di, de eh, di bawah ada penjualan buku uh, seabad Pak Kuncara Ningrat. Hari ini dijual dengan harga 100, tapi setelah hari ini akan dijual seharga Rp129.000. Jadi silahkan kalau mau yang dapat harganya agak miring, uh, apa? di segera uh, beli di bawah. Lalu yang kedua, besok kita masih akan ada acara dalam rangka uh, 100 tahun Kuncara Ningrat. Uh, kita akan pindah ke ruang auditorium uh, FIB ya, di seberang ya. Acaranya pukul 9 yaitu peluncuran dan diskusi buku Kuncara Ningrat Bapak Antropologi Indonesia yang ditulis oleh Prof. Do, Profesor Dr. Hedi Sri Ahim Saputra. Jadi bila ada waktu silahkan mampir ke FIBUI pukul 9 besok. Sekali lagi terima kasih. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oh ya, sorry, sorry. Ibu sama Mbak Sita, Mbak Maya, monggo. Foto di depan bersama Prof. Lalu ya Mbak Yulta dan jadi Mas Muka kali. Setelah ini boleh foto bersama yang lain-lain. Oh, oh ya oke okay, oke. Okay. Jadi katanya kat, di depan Bapak Ibu sekalian. Jadi sekarang foto keluarga dulu. Nanti setelah ini fotonya Pak fotografer akan naik ke panggung untuk foto bersama ya. Jadi mohon sabar sebentar. Thank you.